what is going on everybody sorry for the delay i've been working on some big things behind the scenes and i'm happy to announce them now so if you read the internet yesterday depending on when you're listening to this i executive produced the new many eyes album from keith buckley nick belmore and charlie belmore it's probably one of the best things i've ever worked on and uh, the new songs coming out is premiering this thursday on octane at 8 p.m east coast time and it'll be available at midnight thursday so friday the single is going to be available so happy that we can announce that he's signed to uh, perseverance media and going to be doing a bunch of podcasts to support the album going to be doing a bunch of stuff on keith's patreon and my patreon as well behind the scenes stuff studio stuff we're getting so, keith back on the show oh yeah he's back oh, we're gonna yeah. do uh we're gonna do a bunch of stuff in support of this tour that we're gonna tell you about right now it's thursday rival schools and um and and many eyes um it's starting in buffalo ending in new york remind me to get you tickets if you want to go to that new york show it's going to be killer uh they're doing war all the time uh right they're doing yeah they're doing the whole album that's what it says yeah yeah so awesome. and this yeah it's it's a great opportunity for keith i'm really happy it's a new beginning and it's a great opportunity for my label and thank you everybody who supported you know corpse grinder ripper the last two Josta releases uh crowbar um all the stuff that we put out Milwaukee so metal fest milwaukee metal fest compilation is out you get it at martyrstore.net and while you're over there donate to keith's record and you can get your name in the thanks list just like you did on corpse grinder and just on crowbar and and ripper so big big exciting news right there and also want to tell you to go and support our sponsors factor meals get that which who, they're great i love factor you know why i like it because they give you these restaurant quality options like bruschetta shrimp risotto you stir the risotto you got to stir it i mean the you stuff on really the menu is it. crazy crazy like, green goddess chicken grilled steakhouse filet mignon ready in just two minutes go to factormeals.com slash just a 50 you're gonna get 50 percent off plus you're gonna get uh well wait, actually you got to use the code plus the link or do you or is the link plugged in when you go it's yeah, the link is plugged in when you go, but also when you go to plug in your promo code at the end, just put in that just a 50. Right on, right on. Big thank you to Factor Meals. Also, thank you to IndieMerchStore.com. Go to IndieMerchStore.com. Get all the metal merchandise that you need. Get it now before Christmas, before the Christmas rush. Like, do how early do you do your Christmas shopping? December 20th. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. You know, if you the, the Cannibal Corpse shirts are going to be sold out by then, so I would say do it now. They're they're out there killing it. Shout out to George. He actually just signed some more LPs and CDs. If you want to, I know I shouldn't be plugging MartyrStore.net when I'm plugging IndieMartyrStore.com, but you'll see they they got a ton of restocks. Gojira, Slayer, Lamb of God, Cannibal Corpse. Then they got their best sellers. You know, bands like Iron Maiden, Infinite Annihilator, which hard. You know, <laughs> that that's uh yeah that's. I've worn that shirt before. You get a lot of looks. Go to IndieMerchStore.com. Use the promo code JASTA10. It's slightly more relevant these days. Let's. Uh, <laughs> oh, geez. I don't even wanna, we don't even want to go there. Um, while, while we have you, check out GasDigital.com. There's no more. It's, it's just GasDigital.com. That's so, it. It's streamlined. Everything's new and shiny. Go check it out. We got and, some new shows uh, coming on board. So uh, and, be on the lookout for that. Yeah. And I saw... Um, who, who, who did I just see? Oh, I saw uh, a shout out to Ian Fidance. I'm going to go on his podcast, um, but I Ian saw Ian? he had some. One of them. Doesn't he have a show on Gas Digital? I was just telling my daughter. Are you going on the show with guys. him and Zach? Bye, guys. I'll go on both. I'll go on all the shows. I got oh, a yeah. record to promote soon. Well, oh, what's yeah. his one on Gas? It's Bye, guys. Yeah, it's with him and Zach Miko. When do they do that next? Oh, uh, they uh, they do it weekly, if I'm not mistaken. So. All right. So shout out to Ian. Yeah, he just hit me up. Um, and then patreon.com slash Jasta. All right. We have accomplished American musician, painter. The guy is so talented. This might be one of the most talented people we've ever had on the podcast. The one and only John Baisley from Baroness. Now onto the show. Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. My friend, the lead singer of Hate Breed, the infamous and notorious Jamie D. 
Jasta is in the building. That's what's up. Jamie Jasta from the metal band Hate Breed. That guy's famous. Coffee, death metal, and push-ups. That's Jamie Jasta. Remember Jamie Jasta? You know him. He's podcast, but he's also he's a metal man. I would say you eat that. That shit is hard. Okay. There he is. I'm here, right? Yeah, okay. Sorry about that, y'all. No worries. Good to have you. I uh <laughs> I I gave the record another listen this morning. It's you should be proud. It sounds amazing. <laughs> and <Nice>. uh <laughs> and I was I was I'm always weary of the self-titled, especially this deep into the career. I'm like, right. did you guys did you guys just not not agree on Well, we did it's not, not it's it's <laughs> It's not self-titled though. Oh no, Stone, right? It's called Stone. Yeah, yeah, it's called Stone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. See, sorry. No, I'm already... I'm I'm with, I'm I'm with you though. The Oh shit. Did I lose you? No, I got you. Okay, sorry. Um I'm always pretty weary about the self-titled thing too. I think it's like uh I think you pretty much have to know that you've recorded the best thing you're ever going to do in order to do that. It's just kind of a bold move. It's kind of saying like this is the one, but I'm not I'm never. I, we're never going to have the one that's like the end, the end all, be all. We're we're always trying to get better. So yeah, there's never going to be a self titled record. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I I think I was just confused there because on that. Well, dude, talk about confused. Like I'm not good with the tech stuff, anyways. And on that link, I kept having to reset my password. And then when the phone would close, I figured out a way for the album to keep playing when it would close, but it would say. It it only showed it it wouldn't show the song title. It would only say Baroness S T, but it just was cutting off the stone. Oh, <laughs> and I'm like, and, and it and it also said like on every link that Brian replied to, that's where it cuts off. It'll say like Baroness upcoming album S T, yeah. but it's just it's just getting cut off. But dude, Anodyne is what's your favorite track? Anodyne is my favorite right now. Really, you like that one the best? That 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 might. It might be one of my lesser favorite ones. I really like. I, I really like because I think it's going to be a great song live. I think Magnolia is fantastic. Another um, good one. I like. I like. I sort of like our slower, like sort of more mid pace kind of plodding, ballady, emotional kind of thing. So I like that. I like Under the Wheel. Um, and I yeah I don't know I li- I I like the whole thing actually. Uh, there was a point where I disliked slash was ready to toss away this record uh for a while so come on um, i got to yeah it took it took me it was a while it was a, it was a i would say this was a was a fairly difficult record to finish uh it wasn't hard to start it was really fun to make all the instrumental versions of these songs but then when it came time to add vocals to them uh i kind of had to freak out and it, i mean it took it took me a year year and a half to, to really finish up. Yeah, yeah 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 it was it was a weird thing. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously that's never happened to me before. Uh, but I think also the process of going through like a, like it, it felt like a full on like writer's block sort of thing. Like, um, you know, uh, and I'm sure you, I'm sure you have days like this too, where, where, you know, you, you wake up and, you know, we, we, we take what we do very seriously. It's just, it's just a, I've gotten to the a. I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm happy to call this my profession. You know, I think when we were when we were younger, it was you know sort of this this kind of punk rock attitude that you could you could have where it was like, oh, I don't want to call it a job, man. It's a passion. You know, well, I don't know. I see tons of people who have who are passionate about their jobs. You know, like what well, that that's that's it. that seems like the best thing to call it. But anyway, um, you know, some days you clock into work, and the you know, the job of the day is writing lyrics, coming up with a, you know, coming up with a vocal identity for your, for your new record. And you can sit there all day long and be analytic, be gutsy, be, you know, feel it, think about it, try to write down your ideas, try to just spitball, freestyle, whatever. If you don't walk away with anything at the end of the day, it can be really, (coughs) excuse me, self-defeating. And I think I got stuck in, I got stuck in that for a while but I'm, but I did learn what it was about. I learned, uh, because, because I was trying to get all this stuff done during, you know, during the lockdown, really like, uh, we I'll put it this way back enough. We <laughs> had written most of the like starts of the songs in isolation, um, across 2020, we went in 
towards the end of 2020 in the uh, in the fall, and you know we rented an Airbnb that looked um, strikingly like the background you've got set for for, for this uh, Zoom call. I mean, it looked it, it looked very very similar to that. You know, like a big vaulted ceiling like that, big huge space. Anyway, we lived we lived ate breathed slept this record for for about a month in there um and at the end of it the, the goal the goal in the in the in that studio that we built in an airbnb um uh, out in the middle of nowhere was to get all the rhythm tracks done get all the basic track and get the song you know to write the songs like figure out the compositions for the songs arrange them engineer them record them and then uh in my um in my dirt floor basement i use that's where i usually do guitars and vocals anyway so uh we came out of the studio with 12 songs 10 of which are on this record and i've never had to sit with an entire studio recording that has no vocals whatsoever and go all right well, what, what do i do with it you know and we've been have you, you know, have you done the process like that before um i've done we've done similar process this this is this is a effectively a DIY record, whereas we've worked with producers in the past, right? So for this record, what, like, think about this. We started it, we started writing it in about mid 2020, right? We started recording it and we, we built the studio in uh, the fall of 2020, in, uh, October or November, like around election time, you know? And then uh, went back home for the holidays. And after that, 2020, early 2021, Gene and I, uh, did all the guitars and then started getting the vocals and it, 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 you know, that, that was one of the most difficult, uh, professional challenges I've had because I, I feel like being creative, it comes easily, you know, having the impulse to, to create something comes easily. Very frequently the, the reality of, you know, where the rubber meets the road and, you know, where your creative impulse turns into something legitimate, whether it's visual art or lyrics or music or movies or, uh, writing what, what, whatever you do um there you know there's like kind of an ebb and flow there's sort of like a, a push and pull that you and your heart and you know everything that you feel compelled to do and all 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 of the creative impulses and you tell you to you know to to act and create something physical in the, in the physical world or tangible in the physical world uh but sometimes that's it's a difficult thing you know i think i heard brian may once talking about how uh, he's got melodies in his head. He's just got to figure out how to make his fingers do that. And that's, that's exactly what mu- music is becomes very similar to me. Like I, I dream melodies. They're stuck in my head all day long, but I'm not as, I'm not like a super, I'm, I'm not a prodigy as, as a guitar player or, or as a singer for sure. So nine times out of 10, the work is really just trying to figure out how to take this grand idea and bring, you know, breathe life into it and, 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 you know, bear that child into the world. And, and, you know, it comes out a little rough and ready because um, that's, that's how I am. But when nothing comes out or nothing of substance comes out and you're just sitting there, you, you, you know, you, you go through enough of those self-defeating days where you work all day, but it yields nothing of value that you, it starts to, you know, it starts to wear on your, it starts to wear on your psyche in, in a pretty, in a pretty real way. So I was afraid that I was going to get stuck <clears throat> in that rut. And I didn't know why it was so hard for me to find that last and, you know, arguably most important piece of the, of the puzzle. Uh, and then we, we got out, we got out in spring of 2021 or excuse me, fall of 2021. Um, and started touring again. And as soon as I was out on the adventure, as soon as we, we hit the road again, as soon as we were in front of crowds, as soon as I had a life, you know, as soon as my life, you know, sort of blossomed in, in, in that way that it did, you know, when everybody's leaving lockdown, then all the ideas came out. And, that, and then I realized that because of the way that I write, you know, because of the subject matter that I write about, which is intensely personal, it's, it's, always, it's, always, a, it's always me thinking about things that have happened, uh, dealing with and struggling through challenges and, and using music as an outlet to, um, to work through those things. Um, but I didn't, re- I had never realized how important it was to have, to be out in the regular world, you know, to, to be having, um, you know, conversations with people, having, you know, absorbing different cultures, different cities, you know, just being on the road, that, that was really all I, that was just, uh, 
that was a hundred percent of the fire under my ass that I needed to, to really get in, dig in there and finish the record out. Um, because as somebody who suffers from, you know, a variety of social anxieties and mental <coughs> physical substance stuff as, as somebody who struggles with those sort of things, um, in the normal world, I have always found that touring a lot puts me in an environment where I feel comfortable talking to people, where I, where, where all of the, all of those things that are super, super challenging for me in my, you know, in my home County, uh, become much, much simpler. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it, 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 it was it's interesting to me. Yeah. It's a, yeah. well, and that's what it is. Like I don't connect with people easily. I have a very hard, you know, even friends that I have, everybody, everybody who knows me will tell you that it's really hard sometimes to get in touch with me. I'm just, sometimes I just kind of check out. And typically the, you know, the rhythm of my life goes, you know, you tour for six months and it's people, you know, you're talking all day, you're engaging with people, you're, you know, having, having fresh experience, having unique moments of day in and day out. Every, you know, every night we're in some, somebody's town, it's their night to party. So we see the wildest thing all the time, every night. When I get home, I shut the door, pull yeah, the blinds, and you know, and you got, right. So, and, and for, for a lot of us who are like this, I think when, when the pandemic kicked in, it, it was really like, oh yeah, I can, I can deal with this, I'm alone. When I'm at home, I know I'm at home alone all the time. I can deal with this really easily. But I didn't realize how important having that balance of also being out on tour uh, and, and using that the, the way that I use that. I didn't realize that not only was it something that was like missing from me uh, socially and, and like mentally and physically, but, but there also was a creative aspect to it that I wasn't aware of. So once we got back on tour, the, the whole thing sort of came, came back into shape. But it was, you know, it was a very interesting lesson to learn. Um, uh, it sounds like it because it, it almost makes me think that when you got out there, even though the music portion was done, playing live and reconnecting with people and just getting back into that almost like it's almost like a flow state. Like if I can get into a flow sure. state, I'll come up with better lyrics, better riffs or a more of an earworm. Like sometimes I'll admit, you know, I'll go to a different place on the neck or I'll especially if I'm writing for an artist that's got to sing melodically over it. I can't even imagine if it's, you know, after listening to your record now a bunch of times, I can't even imagine what it was like to be married to these arrangements and the record's done and then kind of not have the opportunity to, oh, let's change, you know, my vocal melody is kind of clashing sure. with yeah, this yeah. note. Yeah. Let's change this riff. You're married to it, but I, it doesn't... It, I would have never guessed you did it like this. I would actually... I don't, I don't, no one wants to do it. I don't ever want to do it. Like this. I said, you know, at this, at this stage when I'm like promoing the record that we're about to release, I'm always having, I'm always having quiet conversations with the rest of my band going, we're never, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> Next time we write a record, we're going to start with a stack of my papers that have all the words and we're just going to fit that in. I would say that this, it, it really, you know, the way that we made all of this music was really, it, the, 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 let me say, let me rephrase this the concept with which we approached the way to make the music had to be uh th there was an integrity there that had to be adhered to the entire time and then and backing up that the idea the way that we recorded the music was really uh that we you know we went to this we went to the site um and we took all of this music that we, had, you know, everybody in the band contributes, everybody writes music. So we took all of all four of our songs we sort of whittled it down to the strongest material, knowing that no one else had and had ever had, you know, the lived physical experience of playing the music. And then we, you know, the, the goal was just like, OK, well, let's focus on two songs at a time. We'll just rehearse 12, 14, 16 hours a day, just constant jamming wow. with very little verbal anything you know there was no there wasn't like theory talk there wasn't there wasn't anything other than you know we, we would stop if somebody had a good idea in, in terms of an arrangement and say well hey well, why don't what if we put a pre-chorus here or something like that other than that it was just like it was almost like a close your eyes sit back and just realize that what's happening is the the verbal discussion that you, you normally have as a band has now been eradicated we're having it in real time with our instruments and that's a beautiful thing. So no one wants to slow that down. You know, we want to let that we want to let that go as much as much as possible. And I think that the thing that that my 
my bandmates are exceptionally good at at this point uh, is understanding that when we're working instrumentally, that there is going to, you know, we're not a band where, where it's just like savage vocals all the time. So it's just got to be punctual and it's got to like, it's got to match the guitars. It's got to match the drums. There's got to be some rhythmic thing. In fact, I think great vocals when you're dealing with a little bit more melodically or a little bit more with, you know, like a traditional vocal arrangement requires that the rhythm section allows breathing moments for this for the vocalist and that there's a you know that there, there's a pocket and a rhythm and a tempo uh and you know for instance like it would seb our drummer has to think in these situations like where can i put a fill that's that's probably not going to uh fuck up the you know my any partic- particular yeah, ca- cadence on, that i might bring on, to the table turn. right so then and then i have to be more you know as a vocalist uh, uh, with a record like this i have to actually be a little bit more like a musician and find the space to insert myself uh and find find a flow that works around the musical template so what i'm describing uh to me really i mean i think the magic of making this record was that we had got we had gotten to a point where our internal musical chemistry was such that we really didn't need to talk about it we really were without articulating it without you know without defining it at any point we really were creating music and make creating arrangements with with the with with the musical part of the record that that left that space in a really convincing way so it wasn't a terrible challenge to me uh in the way that like when we did blue record for instance again that was another, that was the other record where we had all the music uh prior to the prior to the vocals and uh it was a different it was a sort of a different recording situation but um, our guitar player at the time, Pete and I, uh, would just have to, you know, when, once we had all the music done, we would, you know, track and track all day long, 10, 12 hours and go back to our hotel, this was in Dallas and just spend every single waking second that we could trying to write enough lyrics to get through the, you know, to make the next day valuable in the studio. And it sort of worked and it was kind of, you know, kind of a lightning in a bottle situation. But I remember then promising that i would never do that again and you know lo and behold here we are with this record that's how it had to happen but because the music was so um um it was so instinctual like you can hear it you can absolutely hear i said that as soon as the last word dropped i was like wow it feels like you guys are finishing each other's sentences and you came out that's what that's what it is yeah like you came out of the gate taking us to groove city and like a lot of times when i get i've heard so much music and my ears get fatigued but a lot of times when i get the promo if i if my ears aren't fatigued if i wasn't in the studio that day and i know i want to book the guest or i know i'm going to be seeing the band at like a festival or or seeing them on tour and i want to and they say yo did you check out the record like cannibal corpse you know i got paul coming on and uh you know they asked me did you listen to the record yet and i hadn't but when i got when i got just the single last word i i was i had that turn that shit up moment like where i was like well, yeah, hold yeah. on like turn this turn this up because you hit us with the groove city and then i wondered <laughs> instantly how the fuck are they gonna get back to this and then right. when you come back to it when you come back to <laughs> yeah, the yeah. intro it was i don't want to say out of left field but it was but in an interesting way where it still was like you're finishing the sentences and that's a hard thing to achieve when you're dealing with dynamics like you're dealing with in that song. So I yeah, and I, and I think that's a good one. That's a good one to bring up too, because um, everyone, every one of us wrote a fairly significant section of that song. And so, you know, where, where G, G, I think Gina had written that, that, that whole, she had written the sort of heavy intro and we worked on that and she and I kind of came up with something that I could, I thought could move into a song. Like, I think I wrote the verse, uh music and then uh, our bass player nick wrote the entire chorus and then sebastian had a couple ideas that that kick in in the end i mean he certainly wanted to do the the sort of groove out thing uh which is just that's just a an improv you know like there's about i would say about 25 percent of our records just improv improvised moments or songs that we didn't edit down for you know to to a reasonable uh, you know, digestible <laughs> moment. So, you know, nine times out of 10, I think the songs are about four or four and a half minutes long, but they're six minutes on the record because what we had developed in the years leading up to this, uh, to this record was 
uh, we we had during our sets we realized that like you know as, especially as we started to play longer and longer sets for instance we did two tours in 20, 21, 22 that you know saw us playing three hours a night and and it was everything from like a, like really really mellow acoustic stuff to like big uh, you know the big sort of catchy ones and then all the songs off our EPs back when we were like a crust punk band so there was. A, a ton of variety on it and we realized that on on those stages and then when we we're doing this big tour in europe in 2019 that we were wearing people out if we didn't let ourselves just sort of jam for a little bit you know and, and i I, my, I know my bandmates at, at times have always been have been a little reticent to uh engage in jamming on stage because it is you know i think in many cases it comes off as a little self-indulgent but i think we, what we had done is we had earned that we had earned the right to do it because our concept was pretty much like if we're you know the more improvisational we get the more sort of instinctual moments that that we would sh we would have on stage the less likely any one of us was to like make it a lead moment it was more like we're all fucking tired and these people's ears are just like bleeding from you know our 12 to past 12 minutes of like un you know just like constant music so let's just let's just like lay back in the cut for a minute or two. There's still music happening, but it's gentler, it's softer, and it's giving everybody like a little bit of a break, you know, whatever, you get a beer, you talk to people, talk to people next to you. So, you know, when it came to this record, we, we were, I think, we really let ourselves, we let those moments happen. So, we, you know, it, the, the end two minutes of last word, the end two minutes of shine, uh, the end two minutes of Magnolia, the entire song of uh, choir are it's just an improvised improvised music in the moment, and we chose not to like futz with it too much and just kind of let it be what it is because it it kind of had that feeling of uh, it had that, that, that is you know that similar sort of feel to live music where there is a certain tension that there's a sort of musical tension that I think is really beautiful that happens when no one really knows what the other people are doing. And you don't even know really where, what the destination is. You have no idea how, where you're going. You just sort of speak to one another using your instruments and you get there how you get there. But it's really a matter of having respect for your bandmates and giving them the opportunity to respond to you or or waiting for them to, you know, you know, in musical terms, like ask a question so that you can respond to it with a melody or a groove or, or a, you know, a tempo shift or a dynamic uh, shift or decrescendos, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever needs to happen, you just sort of feel it out. And that was the kind of record we wanted to make. So it meant that we didn't, we had to, we were more interested in, in, in creating an, a, you know, a, a musical environment with these sort of half written songs that would never really get refined or completed in the in the normal way where you rehearse something till you got the arrangement and then you get in and you go okay well let's let's get all the drum fills let's make sure that we get all the melodies and harmonies very synchronous let's make sure that all those like fun details that are fun for each particular musician are uh intact i think it really you know a lot of times it really comes down to like how much a drummer wants to prepare because you know as as you are well aware like tracking drums is you have to play and if you fuck up too badly that's it for the take you go back you start from scratch because you can't you can't just jump in and, and hope that your energy level is exactly where it was before as a you know as a as the rhythm section as a drummer specifically and, and you guys have never felt like one of those bands that are so gridded out where you could do a paste and it and the paste won't sound um noticeable like you're you're definitely one of those bands or i i don't know if you're playing to a click or a grid but it feels like i it feels like there's a element of human air that is incredible like it's it feels real like i'm i'm actually more fatigued to the bands that are too digitized and too um you know on the grid yeah i think i and i think i think that is a it, it is sort of a funny thing to me that there is this preconception that if you're if you have the ability to stabilize and quantize and and um put everything exactly in a in a digitally perfect place that that's somehow going to be better for music like 
it's funny that you have to talk about you have to convince people that's not the case because to me that sounds like it sounds like you're using a machine to alter and remove personality you know i think in yeah. some cases of course i mean because we have recorded too quick we have certainly used some of the corrective um techniques that that have existed in recording forever and a day everybody does you can you, you know you have to overdub you have to punch in you have to you know if there's one half of a drum take that's a, ab absolutely amazing and then the second half of that song that's from a different take is absolutely amazing figure it out you know it's it's not that hard I mean, you know cut and tape back in the day so it's not that we're above that it's just that th it's more important to me always in every situation uh, of my life and this but but primarily uh, creatively what i'm speaking to here it is critical that the artist recognizes what it is about them that 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 it, that others d define as character you know because to to us as as singers i think it's it can be really challenging because the thing that we think is a flaw in our delivery you know whether it's a, cr a voice crack or a little like a little yelp whether it's a sort of flat, flat note, whether it's a sort of funny cadence or whatever, those are the things that actually define us. That those are the differences between us. Those are the, you know, that, that's how we figure out what, what kind of special little snowflakes we are. It's through those, it's through those things that we as, as the artist seem to think are errors and flaws. Right. Um, but, you know, the way that, the way that, because we made this record ourselves and, for the you know nearly two and a half years that this thing was was being created, there were only four people in, alive that had ever done anything with it in terms of writing, in terms of you know plugging amps in. Like there was no assistants, there was no engineers. We did we did everything ourselves. So we had the opportunity to take some of these nuggets of wisdom that that a lot of bands we we were, we were very guilty of being in a studio and saying. Oh, you know what rules about you know you know what rules about a Zeppelin record, man? It's like they fuck up all the time. The tempos are all over the place. Then you get into the studio and your producer's like, wait, you know. And we were look, we've even worked with some pretty like out there producers. I mean, almost exclusively. <laughs> and then and then you get you know and then you Who's hear the your most song. out there. Who's the most out? There I mean, by far? Dave Fridman and John Collin are both willing to absolutely destroy a song in order to make it cool. You know what I mean? Like they're using they're willing to take something that's clean and pure. And bore and maybe boring and and just to it to add excitement just to add I don't know distortion compression or like you know like anything that's not it, to me the thing that the thing that was always appealing to me about working with people like that because it's it's the way I prefer working is that you know is that we don't go into a studio environment with these rigid ideas like I'm a guitar player I'm going to go in there and play guitar like motherfucker if I want to play guitar I could play a guitar with this glass I could make anything into a guitar and fulfill the role of that guitar so i love you know guys like dave and john were really great for us because i don't like i like to switch my guitar every song i like to switch my amp every song i like to switch the mics every take sometimes you know and just like experiment and get new sounds i'm never i move so you know i, I get so excited and i move so fast in, in creative environments that i never keep a tr i never keep track of what i'm doing so when it's like, oh, how do we get that sound again? I don't fucking know. So, you know, thank, thankfully for me, like, you know, in, in, uh, with this record, uh, Gina was essentially the assistant engineer. So she kept, she kept like painstaking notes. But, you know, when, you, when, when you've like grown up in, in, a, in a studio with like producers who are more creative than they are um, calculated and, and clinical, um, then, then when you finally have the opportunity to produce your own record, you're not going to like ignore that thing that got you here. You know, it's, for us, it was like, well, let's go a little wilder with it. Let's take that idea that we have of like not caring if there's like warts and bumps and cuts and scrapes and not worrying about what the details are. Just let the fucking music. It's it can become a binary thing where it either rules or it fucking rots. And if it's sitting there rotting, just do it till it rules. You know, it's like you don't have to, there doesn't have to be. You don't have to write a you know a, a ten page thesis on why the song works from a standpoint of an, a, you know analysis or theory. Some t and which which we all do. You know, like I happen to play in a band with a bunch of theoreticians now, and you know musicians who What's that have. Called? What do you mean? 
what's the name of that group? Oh no, no, no. That's that is my group. Like that that's oh, okay. Nick and Seven right, Gina. Yeah. They all okay. they've 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 all they've all they've all studied music. Uh, in a more formal tradition, they, they so all you're the ca- so you're the caveman. I, I, w- I would say that I was at one point, <laughs> but you know, you hang out, w- w- when you hang around with people who speak theory, that becomes the language that you speak. It's like if I played in a band with three people that spoke Spanish, at some point, I'm just going to have to start speaking Spanish because it's not fair of me to speak like a barbarian about music and say, "Oh, this is that one that's like." This is like the Slayer, the Slayer part. And they're all like, well, isn't that a minor nine? Well, eventually I'm just going to start calling it a minor nine. You know, I, right. I, I don't really, I don't really want to, but. I thought um, you were going to say you had a side project with like Portnoy and Petrucci or no, something, no, no, something no, no, like no. coming out. But that would, that would could... be, that would be hilarious. No, I mean, I, th- I think, I think in our band, like Sebastian and I like kind of come more from punk rock. So we're a little more like scrappy, like, you know, the, the, the grit on the the grit on our playing the grit on my voice the funkiness of the you know the way that i play sometimes like that is the cool thing to me but it's put it's it's putting your you know money where your mouth is on that and and actually you know actually making a record that way where you go okay well yeah we could fix it we can correct it but i don't but none of us think that it would be better if we corrected it you know it's 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 the, it's this thing it's like do you want to hear dark side of the moon with a beat detective on it? Cause I have, yeah. it sounds, you have, crazy. it sounds fucking crazy. Yeah. Cause when that first, when that shit first came out, uh, somebody, I was in a studio with somebody and they were just like, yo, check it out. I, I gritted, I gritted dark side of the moon and it sounded horrible, like horrible, not, not, we didn't even, we didn't even have to get in like some subjective, you know, some subjective like discussion about it. It was horrible 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 objectively yeah. horrible so i you know i don't sabbath think... is the same way to- totally totally like and, I mean, and and so so a modern drummer could sit here and go oh bill ward is like no no no, just don't it's not you're in different you're two you're in two different playing fields you're in two different worlds and, yeah, who and just, both who are gets fine to just, who gets to decide that like music is a math problem all of a sudden it's not like that's right. the, the, be- the beautiful thing about music is there's math involved. You know, it's it's like for drummers, it's all fractions. Well, I guess for guitar players, it is too. We've got 12 notes, like, you know, Western scale. We don't, there's, there's no more, you know, you can only do, there's a, there, there are some limitations. There are some finite aspects of playing music. Playing to a metronome shouldn't be the, the like status quo it's you should playing to a metronome should be used when the song benefits by having a metronomic quality you know like the clash you don't want to hear the clash too yeah. s- too square it's just it'd be it'd be it would it would yeah, work or like earth against, wind and fire or BG's, it would work like... it, yeah it works against the music it doesn't work with it like it's it, it part i think i think the thing that that's become interesting to me at, at this stage in our career is is the, this idea that like you whatever band you play, you need to realize what you're doing. You need, you, you do need to think about what it is that makes you special. So for instance, if you're Meshuggah, maybe it does make sense to play to a grid because they've taken the idea of the grid and made that the extreme aspect of their music, you know? Um, or, you know, there, there, and there's plenty, there's plenty of it. Like pop, pop music might sound bad. I mean, music, music where you're going to have to like predictably have DJs spinning it. And matching with our tracks maybe that's better than if it's always because then you can push it and pull it what is up everybody the big news is keith buckley is back and right now you can contribute to his album you can get your name immortalized in the brand new album from his new band many eyes when you head on over to martyrstore.net i am executive producing the album and helping him with his patreon as well if you want to hear a sneak peek of songs but right now uh it's going crazy we got all different tiers you could be an executive producer you can just get in keith's thanks thanks list or you can get a nick and charlie's thanks list you'll see it all over at martyrstore.net thank you so much to everybody who's done this in the past you know we funded albums from corpse grinder ripper um josta crowbar and many others so this is a great way to give back to a, an amazing artist who uh who needs your support and greatly appreciates it so go on over to martyrstore.net and you'll see keith buckley many eyes album contribution sales if you want to get your name immortalized in his thanks list and while you're there pick up a signed copy of the corpse grinder ripper and i will have Anjasta for all pre-orders going up over the next week or two 
Fingers crossed. All right, everybody. Now back to the show. S- someone was trying to get me in this. I, there's a lot of bands that became huge and famous that I just never got. And so <laughs> one of them was this band, Kings of Leon. And I, yeah. I, I'm like, what, I, does he ever say anything? Or does he just moan the whole time? It's, it's, it, and I'm not being disrespectful. It's just not yeah. my thing. And you know, you, my mom's sure. always, you know, everybody's mom would say, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. But you know, the, the first time I heard him, I, I remember it being like very polished. I remember it being kind of like Southern rock. Maybe that's how they were yeah. in the beginning. It was, and they it had, was pretty, the, it, was, it was like, they were like supposed to be the torchbearers for a Southern rock. Okay. And, and, and I remember the silly very, haircuts and the mustaches. Yeah. And I was like, wait, these dudes are younger than me. Like what's going on? Is this going to be a thing again? Like they're going right. to have bell bottoms and stuff. But then it, all of a sudden it was like, then they looked like Oasis and the song was so different to the point where yeah. I was like, I, I don't know anything about this band, but I can guarantee you the old fans think this is fucking sellout shit. And I went online yeah. just to see like if the fans were saying that because I it because it sounded like I forget it was like it was it was everywhere. It was in like fucking what, TJ Maxx. Sex is on fire. That's not oh, it. my God. I wanted to stab my ears. It was yeah, everywhere. Totally, and, totally. and it's it, it's a hit. It's successful. It's it's, totally a, a, it's a smash and more power to them. But it's also like it felt like that one of those things where it's like such a departure from the old music and maybe, I don't know, maybe combined with that visual, I was like, Whoa, what's going on here? Like, did they, did they just pull a 180 and maybe get in with a producer who was yeah, like, yeah. go for it. Fuck, fuck the old fans for everyone that you're going to lose. Right. You're going to gain fucking a thousand which, more, which I'm sure. But, and, they, and, but you know, you, you like, that's something that people say. I mean, you hear that. I hear that. Yep. Const, I hear that constantly. constantly. It's, such, it's such, and you know, I'm, I'm a little bit torn on the reality of it. Like, I think again, you have to realize who you are to realize whether or not that idea is something that's going to actually push you into like so, somewhere good, you know, like the, like a band, like, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to like play the name game, but like there are artists who, who get to that point where it's like, dude, just go, you know, like there's artists that I want to write pop records because I think they're under, I think they're under appreciated. And I think, I think that, that the type of, you know, maybe they're like, like genre wise, they're a little bit restricted. I thirst for somebody good to, to write songs like at the, at the hall and Oates level, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I'm I'm always excited when pop stars write compelling music, you know. I, and I'll I, I'm like a thir- I, I I'm an avid concert goer. So for me, I like I like to go see. You know, I've spent the first half of this year in like basements and DIY venues, but I I'll, but I appreciate arena sh- arena and stadio sh- stadium shows as well. I love going to festivals and just seeing what everybody's up to because every once in a while there is an artist who, you know ups their you know like steps out of the world that they're in without alienating everybody and writing just like complete bangers you know it was like when i guess when um i remember this summer really well the summer that hey ya came out when it was like oh these the the outcast guys just wrote like the feel good banger (laughs) of the summer like and it's it's you know and you couldn't go into you couldn't go into a venue without hearing it you know and you know every dance night in, in you know in the world was like playing that song repeat on repeat on repeat and it was like okay cool well they you know they moved into that they moved from you know kind of quirky quirky but very popular hip hop into just like that's a pop song it's not it's not even recognizable as a hip hop song okay so totally. that's cool that's cool but on the flip side my you know more more than more than like somebody releasing a self-titled album more than like thinking that some producers convinced you know kings of leon that, that they can you know hey hey guys if you get the you know if you get the mcsqueeb haircuts whatever you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be sex symbols and you're gonna sell out stadiums more than that it's when you see promotion for a record and somebody's going this is a re- you know this is a return to the roots you know and i'm like okay hang on hang on <laughs> hang on hang on hang on if you have to return to your roots, then they're not your fucking roots. The roots are in music. They are the thing that doesn't go away. That's why they're called roots because they're always there. It's a foundation stone level 
aspect of your band. So for me, the, the thing is always that you, you, by the time you have to return to your roots, you've already gone too far, you know? And, and that's, I think that's what I hear was, is some, some bands abandon the conceptual spark that was special about them. You know, it's, it's like, it's easy to go, it's easy to go, okay, well, you know, X, Y, Z band just gets a little like clean and more polished over the years. I mean, it's hard to fight that, honestly, you know, it's, and if you could fight it, would you really fight to be dirty and worse or what, you know, but, but it's, it's like, sometimes you'll hear a band who's unrecognizable because they distance themselves from that thing that defines them, you know, and it's not something that you or I get to decide about our music. It's something that, you know, that, that it's something that's there that we don't have control over those. That, that's, that's, that's the aspect of it. And when that's gone, when you abandon that ship and you're just doing something that's too, too unfamiliar, I think that your music has a much greater than 50% chance of like failing in that, in that regard. Um, well, so, you yeah, know, it's, it's, I, I brought, I brought them up as an example, not, not because I'm, you know, and, and listen, if anybody, I'm sure someone will hear this and then I'll get, you know, I, every, there's yeah. always problems with the podcast when you mention another band. I don't like to even do that, but that one was sure. something where somehow I was tapped into the collective, collective consciousness of a certain type of fan where yeah. that one jumped out at me is like, you know, turbo would, if you were a Judas priest sure, fan right. and you know, and you go, Whoa, this is like yeah. real different. I, and and now Turbo, the whole place is singing it. So it's like all is forgiven. Yeah, I mean, which... Turbo's a great song, right? <laughs> so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that's like their Turbo. But the reason, the segue that I wanted to get to was this, oh, was sorry. because when you said, when you were talking earlier about the, the uh, writer's block, it made me think like, when I have writer's block, it's only topically. It's never so much lyrically. I, I can always come up with lyrics, but if I want to go to a certain topic and with that band, they went to a more pop topic, right? Yeah, Something just sure. that casts a wider web. Have yeah. with this record, did you, was that something that caused the writer's block? Like just not having a topic that you really wanted to elaborate on? Yeah. I mean, in, in, in a sense, in a sense, yes, because I, I'm, it's for me, the topic's always pretty simple. Uh, conceptually, and, you know, with regards to lyrics and vocals, every record is just about my experience during, in between the last record and this. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't dip into the past in 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 like a legitimate, in, in like a literal way, uh, and I don't. I, I'm the sort of, like all of my all of my songs are are very personal. They're very they're nine. I would say ninety nine percent of all of our songs are about. Uh, subjects in my in my waking life that I find too difficult to deal with or approach otherwise. So it's a lot of it's a lot of digging in and trying to trying to make sense of myself, trying to make sense of the world, trying to make sense of the experiences that I've had, um, trying to find some new perspective, and most often just trying to take something that feels uh, abysmally dark and trying to turn that the weight of that darkness into something that's light because I find that my experience as a, as the musician, as a, as a songwriter is that those songs have a power. They have real significance and real power for me, the more I mean them. And, you know, a lot of times when younger, uh, younger artists will ask me for advice on, you know, on songwriting or, or lyrics or being a vocalist and, you know, like, like, what can I do to become a better vocalist? And my first answer is always just make sure that you mean everything that you say. And I don't mean in the studio when you record it. I mean, when you're on stage, do yourself a favor and try to get inside of it and try to feel it because you felt it at one, you know, you felt the song when you first wrote it, you felt the song when you recorded it. People were responding to songs on that level. The you're you are you and me and, and my bandmates, we're we are servants to the idea of our songs. You know, like we're not we're not here. The song is not a vehicle to put a spotlight on me. The song is a vehicle for me to be, you know, uh 
I, I'm here to uplift the song. I'm here to submit myself to it. I'm here with my three bandmates so that the four of us can come together and create something that is it far supersedes what we could do individually. And that thing, that, that combination, that syn synchronicity that, that, you know, that good bands have, that, you know, good bands who care about each other, care about what they're doing, who mean and feel uh, all of the things that they deal with in, in, in their music. Um, the, the, the thing that gets created is it's, it's like a little bit, it's a little bit art. It's a little bit craftsmanship. But it's a lot of alchemy. It's a lot of taking like crazy ingredients, forging them through some some bizarre, unknowable crucible, and then what comes out the other end is like it's either powerful or it's not powerful. I mean, what makes any one of our records better than another? It's not. It's not that we put more or less into them. It's just there's some you know there's something that's special that we we don't really get to define and I, I really think it's I think it's a beautiful thing being part of a band as opposed to being a solo artist you know because you're always you're always requ you're required that you respect and rely on your bandmates to help flesh out that picture flesh out that image so for me it's it's like I realize that I realize that my subject matter is super personal but I don't I'm not trying to say that my personal subject matter is more important than you know what sebastian brings to our rhythm rhythm you know it's not more important than what mick brings as a bass player but it is the most it is the most audible thing when you go see a show the vocalist is the most audible thing you know vocalist and the drummer but no one wants to go see a whole show of drums just like no one wants to go see i guess me screaming into a mic without without music but we put all this stuff together and if we're all operating on the same level, if we're all, you know, if we're all working hard and also submitting ourselves to music, just acting as, acting as the, you know, as the servants, as I say, to the, to the song, then occasionally moments of greatness happen. You know, occasionally those incredible songs, those incredible records and those incredible live performances can happen. But I don't have... Uh, I don't have like a whole lot of external control on it. If I did, I would make every show the best show that we've ever played, but you can't do it. You know, there's some nights, there's just something special in the air. And I think it, you know, in live, it's, it's the people like, sure. We, we know, how to, we know, we actually know how to play the music. We, you know, we wrote it, we get up on stage and plug us in. We'll, we'll do the same thing, but without that extra element. So it's, you know, in every different venue, whether it's live, whether it's a studio, whether it's rehearsal, whether it's, you know just me and you talking like there's there's a different dynamic and yet we 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 as artists and musicians have to have to understand what that is uh and realize that it's it's never you know once we've created it once we've seen that like once we see a space in the world is empty and bring something into it whether it's music or art or, or whatever then it's not ours anymore because we've given it we've given it out there uh and it's it's the audiences it's the it's the world at large who gets to decide you know what what to do with it but we still have you, to show up you, and we st and we have to meet you know what i mean you, you don't you don't seem like scared though of the reaction of this record right like you seem very confident and you have every right to be confident of this record but if you did like if you did have to confront that fear i guess similar to kings of leon right because it says here the guy didn't even want that song to go on the record he was afraid of putting oh, really? that song on the yeah, record yeah. So have and you did say earlier on in the show that there was two that didn't make the cut. So would if you had a song that you knew was a game changer, but it was also like a polarizing, maybe I don't want to say it's inauthentic, but maybe was that the reason why he was scared to put on the record? Because I've had that where I I didn't feel something I said was authentic enough or it didn't feel like it was a hundred percent there, but I feel like what you resist will persist. And yeah. That song did go on to be. Successful. Well, I mean, there's in, in some cases, I think that, you know, it, uh, it's like, uh, you know, it's like when you're a kid and you've got one thing that you want to, that you want from, you, you know, like maybe it's like, I want this one thing but I'm going to tell my parents a list of other things. I'm going to hide it in the middle, but they always can hear that change in your voice when you're like, 
you know, and the and the Millennium Falcon, <laughs> you know, or whatever Castle Grayskull, whatever it was for me, you know, like they can tell because you tense up a little bit. So there's, you know, there may maybe there was like enough tension in the, in the band with something like that where they were like. Oh God! Well, we got to do it because, like, clearly there's there's something to it. You know, we'll we'll put it out there and you know, we'll play it if we have to. But just just like that weird attention that you're giving to it makes it more important or something. However, with with, with Baroness, I, I think I was always you know I, I came up in the '90s and I came up in the you know I came up in the era of like posers and sellouts and corporate shills and you know all that all that kind of like. All that kind of talk this it's still around but it's kind of changed at, at the moment um and i always thought the worst thing that could possibly happen was that you figured out you know the worst thing that could happen as a musician is that you figured out how to write music and you just did it the same way every time and you like oh i got the formula dude i got i know how to write a hit um all right so now now i'm just gonna write some hits but that seemed that always seemed really limiting to me because you know, if you figured out the one way to do it, then you're just not going to do all the other stuff that was adventurous. And I think that's why we love being, you know, that's why the golden era of, you know, any, any band is the early years, because everything's new. You're inventing, you know, every day you write a song, you're inventing something, but it can be really, it can be really challenging to like, Oh, well, we got to put the, we got to put a, like a halftime breakdown in the middle or else the kids aren't going to do this and that and the other thing. And, and you know, I, I I used to hate like back in the in the early aughts when, when you'd hear bands talking about like, man, I really don't want to have this song, but like that's what the crowd wants. And I was like, well, you can have it, man, because our whole band was was founded on the fact that we're just going to try to divide. We're going to try to figure out what expectations are, and we're always going to try to defy them. We're going to make a we're going to make it a mission statement that we do those things that could be polarizing so every every time i write a record i'm like make sure that you make sure that you feel that something's going to be polarizing because that means it's gonna that means it's something new that means it's something that's it, it, it's like maybe more personally expo more personal exposure than i feel comfortable with with the record maybe it's being a little tender more tender than you know Bands typical to our genre are maybe it's maybe it's sometimes it's just like hey I sing with melody at, after a certain point or I really like harmony so there's there's always like harmonic elements there's always melodic elements and you know in, coming from a scene where there's plenty of bands who who's where where dissonance is ent entirely the name of the game you know where anti hooks and anti melodies are are critical things P playing in that world but not caring you know. Like if I need to, for me, music, music is just harnessing energy and then using all the tools that we have as musicians to channel that energy to a fine point. So if I'm saying something that's coarse and blunt and needs impact, I'm going to say it like that. But if I'm, if I need to, if I need to cast a little magic, if I need to, if I need to bring the mood down, then you slow down. You say, you know, so we all that's all we're doing anyway i mean guitar is sort of incidental the drums are incidental the voice is incidental they're, they're just tools to uh, you know channel the energy so so what i what i like what i like to do with our records is make sure that um if, if all i'm trying to do is you, you know channel this energy and tell something about the the lived human experience that i have or the universal human experience then why why would i in this band why would i limit that to distorting guitars why would i limit that to folk guitars why would i limit limit that to screaming versus singing like we might as well do it all because we're we're dynamic people and when you listen to music before the 90s maybe maybe before the aughts that there was a premium placed on ingenuity and creativity there was a premium placed on scope you know uh, but then, but then, you know, then we get to a certain point where it's like, all right, everybody drop, you know, figure out what your lane is and stay in it. Don't, don't call outside the lines. I'm like, fuck that. That's like the whole appeal of music to me as a, as a young person was that it seemed like a place where you could just be yourself, you know? And if yourself is sort of weird and ugly and challenging, yeah, like have at it. Like, 
there is there you know punk music in the 80s was so great because it just was strange you know it's not yeah it's not all i mean fugazi is a great example like they were constantly trying to be out go out on a limb black Have you ever heard of auto-tuned uh fugazi don't <laughs> yeah. listen to that listen yeah, exactly. to auto-tuned fugazi it's like what that's so fucking weird yeah it's, it's super crazy. weird crazy but no you're right there was like whole areas where there was eclectic sounds that were totally different and they weren't that's why i say all music is like it's like casting spells and breaking spells at the same time like yeah. we would go do shows with no effects and the kids do the same exact things as the shit that we did when we go play with slayer and we'd still sell the same amount of merch on each and i always thought the well, genre shit is bullshit it's all genre it's all shit is bullshit it's all how you deliver it and you're and if you're confident in it and if you're you got to cast one spell and break another and a lot of times that's probably why that shit is so fearful right like because they right. probably knew like a band like kings of leon was like fuck we just cast a real powerful spell we can't yeah, yeah. control and well, we're fucked and it's, it's just gonna... and it is it is tricky because you then then you have to then you have to mature into the new place that you know <laughs> back to the kings of leon thing you put out sexes on fire then you got to be that you yeah. know well so, you put, so i say like, you're you, doing you, it you're doing it on this record like it's very confident like it feels big and bold but it has all the elements of the previous work, but it has these moments where I go, wow, this is like a fucking hook, like a hook you'd hear in a smash that you, that I'm not, cause I, my exposure to you is like, you know, Gordon sending me the promo when you were, sure, I think it was yeah. right when you're on relapse or like, I right. saw you guys at the award show that I hosted where you guys, Oh yeah. The golden, checking. golden gods. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like fully vibing on the sound check and, and then um and then we caught you know the performance and you know my thinking is that there are these moments where the jam is is like it's almost too short for the record where i would see like yeah. i would want this extended live to create that vibe because you want you like when i hear this record i want to go buy a ticket and that's yeah. that's a great i guess for lack of a better term spell to be casting because it feels like you want to go connect with these songs live. So I think you did, you guys did a great job uh, with this in that sense where I, I'm like, damn, how are they going to even fit some of these into the set? Like, what do you take out? Well, we, you know, one thing, one thing I, I really loved recently uh, with this lineup of the band, and this is like, you know, it's, it's Sebastian and Nick rhythm section have been in the band now for 10 years and Gina's been in for six or seven. So this is the most, this is the most stable version of our lineup. We've been through quite a few and uh i think the thing that we've that we've realized in recent years having so much of a bat you know having so many songs in our back catalog and so many different types of songs is that if as long as as long as we just like are fired up and psyched about every record that we make we've never had a single problem or you know just throwing everything into a blender on stage and, and going like well is this you know is a is a new song going to work you know sandwiched between two old songs it's, that's not even i don't think that's an issue at, at all what's become a little bit more interesting for us is that we can kind of play the crowd now so you know if we're doing you know if we're, if we're playing with hardcore bands we can do a we can do like a, a little bit of a faster more high energy kind of edgier set and if we're you know if we're playing with something that's you know a little looser and a little jammier we can just do that the whole time and you know gina and i are perfectly willing and ready to sit down and play an hour hour long like acoustic set like it's we've done so many things that that in, in, you know on a on an impulse level seem like oh they might be weird or they might freak people out but i i i was always you know my point has always been that if you constantly create these challenges for for yourself as a musician if you constantly create those same challenges then for your listening public and the audience and you're never trying to write music for the audience you're only trying to write music for yourself then all i have to do is is be convinced by my own bullshit i just have to i just have to feel what i'm doing and my excitement or my you know my level of investment with what we're doing or the groups and the group's investment is and 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 energy with it is that's what you're hearing you know it's, it's like the difference between good bands and great bands is that great bands have all that energy they feel they 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 feel like they mean it you know and 
So I, I just I, I just feel like every time we put a record out, we need to definitively continue to say we we won't be pigeonholed. We won't be we won't s- stop expanding, even at the even like when common sense says, yeah, like refine refine your thing until it's perfect. I say for me, that's there's no success in that. Success is is just. Mm, I I define success by being a being better and more fluid at the way that I am able to express myself with each record. So as long as we're continually absorbing new sounds and new ideas, and you know the best way to do that is to tour with fucking exciting bands, and you know have a little bit of their weirdo magic just rub off on you. And that's 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 what music is. It's just every record you make, you're just stealing little things from your own past and stealing little things from, from everybody else and just throwing it into a blender and seeing how you spit it out. I don't care if you, I don't care about stolen riffs. I don't care about, you know, writing a chord progression that sounds like Marvin Gaye or Tom Petty or whatever, like have had it steal, steal away. Like music, music's this thing that we're supposed, we're just supposed to like copy, copy, copy until we've got something original. And then, and then we're supposed to make something better than everything that's been done before. That's the goal. It's like, the goal isn't to have false humility and say, Oh, I'm good. You know, like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. The, the, like every, every musician who's ever stepped a foot on a stage ha- has a healthy ego has, has like a healthy touch of narcissism that, that lets them say well, what I have to say is worth amplifying it's worth putting through a pa you know so we should tr- we should all constantly be trying to be the best band that's ever existed and you can hear you know you can hear that in hey breed i think you, i hope you can hear it in baroness I, I think you can hear it in every great act ever that they just think they're the best you know like i don't want to i don't care for the for false humility what i because what i'm listening for in music is majesty i'm I'm listening for like the biggest boldest best thing so if everybody's not trying to create the best music that's ever been written then what, what, why would i be interested in listening to it you know yeah um so so that's a great you know, for, point for, for us to put a record out like this it's it's weird to me because uh, of this you know all 10 songs were written in early in 2020 and where there because this record took so long there were plenty of opportunities to just say oh I think we've written 10 better songs since then. Why don't we just work on those? But the, I, the, the there was this, there was an integrity to the, the, you know, the recording sessions that we had. So it was just like, no, 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 no. I'm going to work these things until I love them. And as soon as I love them, then they're songs, you know? Um, and it doesn't, it, the styles and the sounds and the volumes and the speeds, those are, you know, if, if anybody else in the band, wa- in my band wants to worry about like having enough tempo variety and having, you know, a soft, loud thing, I, I just care that the story's there. You know, I care that I care that we serve something that we're proud to play and that we're proud to watch it develop on stage. I mean, that's a, it's a it's a great thing about writing music that doesn't square itself up too much. It's a, it's a great thing about writing music that that isn't binary in a wrong or right way but it's binary in a good or bad way or this rules is doesn't rule way but when it's wrong or right oh you didn't play the riff right so the song sucks then uh, i'm not interested what i like is to take our old songs and not to talk about it but just to change them in real time some there's a couple tunes we have that like if the crowd feels fast we play them fast if the crowd feels slow we play them so there shouldn't be that shouldn't really be the consideration it's just constantly trying to make great music and uh, we'll beg borrow and steal whatever we have to to get there um not i mean not 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 uh steal from other people but like you know for us it's it's just it's just about like the integrity of creating good music and and never getting bored and always having uh you know with each record that we put out feeling like, oh, well, we're, we're not even close to finished saying stuff yet. So we, there's always, there's always more on the horizon, whether, you know, whether our next record's like a power violence record or just like a straight up folk record. I, I don't care. It could be both, you know, that would be interesting. 
I'm still waiting for COC to just do like animosity type two type of record. Like, yeah, dude. It's part two. Like, and I, and I've heard Pepper say that. So when you just said that, it reminded me of him saying that, like, we could do it. We could just go do a fucking hardcore punk record right now if we wanted. I'm like, do, do it, it, please. Do it. Because I'm the asshole it. that's yelling, like, Poison Planet and Mike Dean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you asshole. Um, Animosity no, that, technocracy, man. That's, that's where it's that at. Shit's hard. <laughs> Poison Planet is one of the hardest hardcore songs ever written. It's so fucking hard. I can't even take it. I might have to cover yeah. that. Um, but this, this, you, 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 you should all be proud. It's uh, the record is incredible. Um, everybody go get it and, uh, and make sure you pre-order and support Baroness. Let me just get a couple quite, I know I'm keeping you a little extra time. Here, I don't care, man. I can talk all day. I, I, well, I real I jibber jabber. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Cause everybody was so stoked that you were coming on and I want to get to the Patreon, uh, chat. Well, here. you know what, it, you know, what's cool. Like your your podcast is the only podcast that anybody's that i've that's been your podcast is the only podcast that's been that i've been and basically everybody i know is like dude why haven't you done that jimmy Jackson podcast yet and um i i had never had a, like a really solid answer to that but i know well bannon, I know bannon was telling people... me i should do it years and years and years ago bannon was like oh dude you gotta go on you gotta go on it and i was like yeah to totally and i think we were like we weren't we weren't on cycle at that point but like it's all uh, it's also cool for me because because you guys were like a huge influence on us when uh you know when we were when we were starting out like there was a we had we had a we had a kind of a weird we kind of had a weird blender of bands that we you know we sort of threw together that were important to us uh because we could all agree on them you know in those in those early years it was sort of like oh well some of us were more into like disco and some of us were a little more into like crust punk some of us were more into metal or black metal or whatever we all had to kind of come together on certain bands and you guys were one of them what is up everybody brian and jamie here to tell you about factor meals what's your favorite factor meal uh they got some tandoori chicken or something i was looking at a while back i was like i think i need to get this Dude, I did the keto one like a year or two ago, and they had this dessert. It was some sort of almond custard thing. It was so delicious. It must have been at least a thousand calories, but I was like, you know, when you're on keto, you're just starving. <laughs> so that hit the spot. It was very satiating. I don't know if they still offer it, but it was delicious. And I see here that right now you can get Factors Fresh, never frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes, and you can choose from restaurant quality options like bruschetta shrimp risotto green goddess chicken and grilled steakhouse filet mignon fancy it is this is fancy like you could have a girl over and you could just throw the packaging out and you could be like i made it and you put some like stuff in a pan like and, and they'll be like this is restaurant quality especially if you're too busy running around during the day to think about lunch and who wants to cook dinner and, and slave over a hot oven we had a pile of these at the studio and uh, I was eating them, and uh, they're they're way better. They're not like uh, microwave TV dinners. It's actually like substantive food, for sure, for sure. And uh, you can round out your meal and replenish your snack quality with an assortment of forty five plus add ons. So if you want like breakfast items like apple cinnamon pancakes or bacon and cheddar egg bites or potato bacon and egg breakfast skillet meals. You'll see it all there on the site. Go to factormeals.com slash Josta50 and use the code Josta50 for 50% off. That's code Josta50 at factormeals.com slash Josta50. Get 50% off, Buster, and enjoy your factor. Now back to the show. All right. So before, and thank you so much for, <laughs> again, thank you for the time and thank you for the kind words. This has been great. And uh, people are so psyched. So just a couple more before we get yeah, out no, of here. Yeah, no, no. Let's, we'll keep, we keep going. I, don't, I really, I really, this is good, good with me. Paul Faza Fairly, what's up, Paul? He says, what tracks are your favorite, most fun to play live? Personally, I love Chlorine and Wine and Cocanium. Great, great yeah. song title, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We bought the, I think we bought the domain name for that uh, after I came up with that title. <laughs> uh, what are my favorite songs? I, I really, yeah, I mean, uh, what, was, what was this fella's name? What's the, what's the favorite, most fun, fun ones to play live from Paul? Paul's over in the UK. Well, Paul, I really like playing. I do like. I do really like playing chlorine one. I really like playing our sort of heavy ballads. Uh, that there's a song off of Yellow and Green called Eula that I really, really, really love playing. I, I really, my, you know, my favorite songs to, to play are the ones that have that sort of 
uh, where I, we have the ability to just play them in different ways, depending on how we feel, you know what I mean? Um, you know, the songs that don't have to be played in a specific way. Like, so a song like Okanium, which has got like quite a bit of, uh, sections of that song that we just sort of do them different every time. Those, those songs to me tend to be the, tend to be the most fun to play. Here's, here's one from Mark Horror Armenta. He says, favorite album art as a fan that inspired you to create amazing album art? Uh, I think, okay, this is a pretty, this is a pretty random one, but one of my- Turbo. Fa- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually the Turbo, the Turbo illustration is pretty great. The, the, it's the, hard. The Johnson illustrations are great. Screaming for Vengeance, they, those, that's a great one too. Uh, I really love, <laughs> this is so random, but I always mention the seven, the Bacteria Sour seven inch for uh, the arguably the greatest Savannah, Georgia band of all time, Damned. Uh, there was a Pusshead designed uh, seven inch cover that he did uh, for them that I thought was really great. Also, the full length for Damned, Burning Cold, again, Pusshead, great album cover. Uh, I love, I, and I collect, I have them all in your, your body. I love and collect uh, Roger Dean's album covers for Yes, but I absolutely hate the band it's just not <laughs> just like it's just like not from the music not for me and i wish it was because I, I really love those album covers but yeah i mean like when i was nine or whatever when appetite for destruction came out and it's got those like crazy uh robert williams illustrations on the inside and the iconic cover i mean uh, like i just you know j- i just was like an artist like i loved i love that like chaos ad uh that's michael whelan's cover for that and arise wow. those are those are incredible incredible like and and i'm glad you know you know what is really awesome is that n- now there are a handful of real real uh great illustrators doing um you know back to doing death metal covers just like they you know the n- new breed of people working jesse jacoby who did like the, like he does a lot of stuff with like two mold and stuff like that. Like there's yeah. just so many great. And, and then, uh, Paolo, Paolo Girardi, I think his name is, he's an Italian guy. He does like all the like really gnarly, like brutal, uh, brutal death stuff. Um, there's, yeah, there's so many great cover artists now, but you know, like there were, there were some classic records back in the day. Uh, obviously all the Raymond Pettibon stuff for uh, black flag, my war is one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, I love the cover to that. That's, super super strange or you know even a song he covers um there were so many album covers that got me into making uh making album covers for uh, for other bands and in in the early years where i was doing a lot of when i was doing like you know 10 covers a year or whatever uh i would always hide references to those beloved albums like i i think i did a i think i did a shirt design for the red cord way back in the day that had the yes relayer snake in it, <laughs> but it was a snake made out of uh, piss. Um, it's really weird. Made out that of piss. Yeah, it was, it was the shirt design was called Piss Face, and it was this like these Roger Dini kind of snakes made out of urine uh, attaching attacking this person's face. It was that was cool. Yeah, so I don't know, like ton, tons and tons and tons and tons of records uh, from those days that i loved robert williams uh cover for i think it's ludicrous that was fucking <laughs> badass power trip yeah oh my god with the guns on it and then like yeah. the like the 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 sergeant but it, it looks like they're like bugs or something like they're like, yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah that dude's that dude's a sicko but in the best way but see, um, but but i but i love that stuff because there's like there's so much it's like so visually captivating but there's also tons and tons of weird little details that you get in there and pick apart and i think that's you know for me that's very frequently that's like the act of listening to mute listening to a record you love over and over again is you first get the the big picture and then with subsequent listens you're going in you're you like you want to hear the details you want to hear the you want to hear all the little moments that the musicians made that that are like super incredible and, and sort of buried in there and that's what you know album cover or, or like a like an artist like robert williams is, there is this like this incredibly huge picture but then when you get down on a granular level it's like dude what the fuck are all these little things going on uh that's really cool but, and and like a stark contrast to the the great uh you know like 
album jacket designers that that were were more like graphic designers, you know, like like Jane Doe and Bannon or the Crimson Ghost and the Misfits and you know or the Black Flag Bars, you know, Black Flag's kind of a one stop shop for uh, great artwork, great music. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just it's 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 cool. It's uh, it's cool to me to be at the stage of my life and still like making making artwork for music. I love it. Yeah, no, I love I. I... I love checking out when the covers come out too. I prefer when the song comes out with it, but even when bands do an announcement just for the track listing and the cover, I always, especially if it's a band that I love, I always try to go look and see who did it and, um, you know, support the artists. Like if they're, that's, a, that's a cool thing about doing Milwaukee metal fest. I want to do for next year is like have more artists come sell their prints and, and, uh, wait, what do you do? What do you do, for Milwa- what do you do at Milwaukee metal? Fest? I bought it and I put it on this year. Uh, it happened oh. this past May. Um, we brought it back. We had like Lamb of God and Obituary and uh, uh, Death Angel or a Dark Angel. And uh, how good is Obituary right now? Though? Oh, they they were like the we, people's yeah, headliner. Yeah, they were. Yeah, it's yeah. We had, we I, played Decibel Beer and Metal Fest uh, like four years ago or something, and we had like the you know we had the the, the like good slot of the night, but it was after Obituary. So <laughs> you know, I was like. This why are we here? You know, what's, what's the deal? <laughs> but la- like a month and a half ago, I, I don't know if you saw this tour, but it was obituary immolation, blood incantation and ingrown. It was perfect. It was the that most was the perfect. We added to the fast. Yep. It was the most perfect metal show I've ever seen. Totally. Yeah. Immolation yeah. still killing the game too. Crushing. Immolation. Immolation also like throwing in some more like four, four, like, fucking just straight ahead death metal like hard shit in there like yeah. just peppering it in just enough like not as short well, as like converge I mean, jane doe breakdown sure, but just sure, enough sure. like just two measures like <laughs> yeah but look when you tour with obituary like at some point you're gonna put your four on the floor you know what i mean like they yeah that's it's like it's the reason i think obituary has got that kind of crazy staying power is because those rhythms are good and they're 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 there they're rhythms for the people you know like i'm kind of at the point now where like if death metal is like too technical i'm out i'm out yeah you know like if you don't know there was if you don't know the rock part of it then uh, i'm out yeah i mean there were there was blood incantation was it was over some people's heads but they really brought it too like they had the cult following and they had people like flipping on them too of just like wow this is some tech space alien death metal i don't even know what you call it but it was yeah but there's, a good, there's a good groove there i mean it's like to me they're just like kind of freaky psych psyche prog death metal and that's yeah. cool it's, it's weird and it's out there but they like they know they know how to deliver something that you can wrap your head around every so often you know i think i think that i think that's 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 why they kind of stand above, I think, a lot of their contemporaries. Uh, but you know, yeah, I mean, like, and again, not to just like keep on the tomb mold thing, but like that's what I like about tomb mold too. It's there's like a simplicity to it, or cre- you know, creeping death. Like they, there's just like there's a new crop of bands that are that you know under the death metal umbrella. But there's you know they either they either understand rock rhythms or or like the more like old school, like hardcore rhythms, just the stuff, you know, the stuff that like you want, you know, like there's this feeling that this thing I love doing, like I love getting to a show after the first or second song in a band set. And I love, I love that feeling when you walk into the club and it's happening. And I saw, um, who was it? Uh, dude, who was it that I just saw? Fucking that's what it was like during frozen soul like they put it down yes, like they, frozen soul totally. they put it down too like there was like it was badass like it was or heavy like, as hell dude this one blew me away because i didn't i didn't know how much i was gonna like it but i went to saw i went to see incendiary a couple weeks ago and it might have been like one of the last shows on the tour in philly at, at uh underground arts and i you just like it was like walk down you know two flights of stairs and you just walk in this room where it is just banging and the rhythms yeah. are like you know, you don't have to like, you know, you don't have to wonder, oh, where am I in the song? Like, I, I do, <laughs> I do. <laughs> not with Incendiary. You're like, yeah, I get it. Like, this is just fucking. You know, yeah, they're like, bringing heat. They're coming with heat. They're bringing heat. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, sometimes that, I mean, I, I feel like in the, in that, in the like late aughts and through the teens, 
it was just like it was just about like how fast you could play or how many like how quickly you could change your tempos or you know if you're like a metal band it's like how many uh subdivisions of metal can you cover in one song you know oh well, there's the yeah. part followed by the grind part followed by the blast part followed by the black metal part followed by the sludge part followed by the doom part it's like no nah, dude just like serve it up like make it bang like it, it needs a pop you know uh sure, and i and yeah. i think and i think that's going i think that's i think that's what's really exciting this year about a lot of these like new releases from bands that i'm hearing is even even when the music is like at 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 tip top level, there's still a little bit of meat on the bone for, for you know people to listen to. Because uh, I think some of I think some of that stuff from the teens, when it was just like it was like speed, technicality, and very little like songwriting. I think that stuff's already dated and sort of you know out the window. Yeah, I, I, today I listened to a new job for a cowboy, and like the bass is like pretty prevalent in the mix, and it's kind of got oh, like cool. old school, old school death vibes, but with like a little bit of thrash too. It was, it was really cool. Yeah, I'm excited about it. We're gonna have a great lineup. Of course, Baroness is more than welcome to come play if you want. I'll hit it? up your agent. It's gonna be next May again. So hit up our hit up our agent, and if you're doing if you're doing a um if you're doing like a showing of like artists and prints and stuff like that, like. Uh, It'd I've be got great to have people. you. Yeah. I've got a I've got a small like team of people who who I've been doing that that sort of thing with for better part of ten fifteen years, uh, doing pop up events, bringing uh, you know I'll take I'll take you know different artists you know primarily from like punk and hardcore from around the world and we'll just like we'll set up and uh, you know do a little like great. a poster poster exhibition or some live screen printing or whatever man like that's i really i really love bringing uh i i I, at this stage i really love going to festivals and taking part uh not only in musical stuff but but you know sort of in the creative or artistic side of stuff so if you if you got a space for that man just holler at me yeah we would love to have you i'm gonna hit up tim boar right now shout out to philly shout out to tim boar shout out to Jackie, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see the whole team. Leslie, everybody. I'm the oh, Milwaukee cool. team that we had is amazing too. Like you, like I'm not just big up in myself. Like you can go read the reviews. Like even the even YouTubers that you know will nitpick the different aspects of the festivals. Like we got really good reviews. It, it went off. Yes, it went off well. I mean, we need more. We need more dependable metal festivals in the U.S. because Europe's killing it right now. You know, I'm sure you guys have done a Hellfest or two, but if thing, things are things go things get so good over there when these fest when you know when those european fest like metal festivals take off they become year yearly like landmarks and you know we, I, I know that, that we've got hell in the harbor this year here in baltimore i don't know if there's still, mdf I'm, I'm assuming still goes on decibels doing yeah. putting up a good fight but like Yo, metal lives and breathes in the Midwest, in the northern yeah. Midwest. Like that's fucking, yeah, that's cool, man. Like I'm, I'm glad you brought that back. Right now, I'm calling. I like as soon as I get off, I'm calling uh, Phil Caivano. Shout out to Phil Caivano. Cool. He has a record out, and uh, he worked on our Perseverance album. But and I'm a big uh, Monster Magnet fan. But I could totally see. I'm going to tell him, I'm saying, yo, listen, Monster Magnet, I don't care what anybody says, you are metal enough to play totally. the Milwaukee Metal Fest. And I actually think that could be a cool like bridge band between you guys and another band. Yeah. Like make it like a little bit of everything, a little bit of stoner, a little bit of doom, a little bit of punk, yeah. a little bit of rock, a little bit of death metal. And that's the beauty of like those festivals you were talking about, like Decibel yeah. and, and, and the European ones like Hellfest and Grass Pop. So yeah, I, as soon as I get out this, I'm going to tell Kaivano, like talk to Windorf. Space. It's 25th anniversary of of uh, of uh, Power Trip. Fuck yeah, S- dude! Space Lord, Wait, Mother Power. Mo- right, Power that's Trip? the one with Space Lord, right? I think so. For Not me, to be confused like... with Ludacris Power Trip with the cover of <laughs> <laughs> cover by Robert Williams. Uh, what was the uh, Spine of God was always my record, but it's it's a you know it's a crazy. It's, I think it. I think it's her first. That's the first Monster Magnet record. But I, you know, I, Monster Magnet is one of those bands where when they went into like commercial rock music, I was like, it's pretty good. Dope to Infinity yeah. is a pretty. It's yeah. a pretty good like monster rock jam. Fuck yeah! <laughs> I mean, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I saw I saw them play Trocadero back when that was still a thing here in Philly, and they were they were great. You know, 
and they told like whatever they they might not think so but monster magnets i, I would say 85 percent of their fan base is like metalheads yeah they're like they're like a shoe-in you know yeah let's do it that's a, that, that would it. be fun yeah, I'm calling yeah. him. I'm I'm calling he's my next well, he's my next call. So thank you, John. Appreciate the time. Best of luck yeah, of with course. the record. Where where can everybody find you? Even when you're hibernating, we they won't punish you, but where can everybody do you have so you got socials? Where can they um order the record? Bes- well, you can go to our website, whatever that is. I'm sure if you search Baroness, you can find it. Um, we have social media stuff uh, that everybody hates doing. Um <laughs> You can find us on tour this fall. How about that? Come, come, come up and talk to me IRL, and I'll send you to all the right websites. I'll give you a card and beeper. And you can stay in touch that way. No, uh, yeah, we're, we're records coming out on September fifteenth, uh, and then in October we head out for two and a half months of touring with bands like Jesus Peace, Esuela Grind, Ken Mode, Wayfarer. Um, there's like a thousand other bands. Portrayal yeah. of Guilt, Midwife. There's so many. I'm just going to forget them all. Sheer Mag. There's a ton of bands. Soul Glow. You name it. Your, yourbaroness.com. Yourbaroness.com. There you go. You, there it is. Yep. <laughs> all the dates are there. Stone out out uh, September 15th. And, and thanks again. And thanks so much for the time. And have a blast. Yeah, we're taking out Jesus Peace too. So, yeah, that was like a conversation. It was like, <laughs> hey, can... The Baroness oh, is cool right. with no, them no, playing right. your show. Are you cool with them playing their show? We're like, yeah, just let them play bullshit. Right. We, we we don't stress about the radius shit. Everybody else stresses about that. Two flying fox. I'm like, you know, unless unless it's a band coming through town six times in a year, and I think it I think it really only accounts when you start pushing three five thousand tickets at a time. That's when it matters right. that you don't do two shows. For like, the more Jesus piece, the better. The shows aren't that exactly. long, but they are. They are intimidatingly intense. It's, For sure, it's so hard to it's so hard to imagine following them. You well, yeah, I mean? we're gonna spread the Jesus peace love. <laughs> everybody, everybody, get there early and check them out. John, awesome chat, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian, and thanks everybody from Patreon. We'll be back Friday with Paul from uh, Cannibal Corpse. Fifth, uh, five, no, four p.m. EST. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Bye, yeah, Take cheers. Care. Quick little outro here. Thank you to Factor Meals. Go to factormeals.com slash Josta50. Use code Josta50. And you're going to get 50% off all the killer meals. Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Or if you want to go ham and you want pancakes and cheddar egg bikes, they got whatever you want over at Factor. It's delicious, it's nutritious, and you're going to get 50% off. Go to factormeals.com slash Josta50. Use the code Josta50. Also, thank you to IndieMerchStore.com. Head on over to IndieMerchStore.com for all your metal, music, and merchandise needs. Use the code Josta10, and you will save 10% off. Go to their Instagram. Tell them Josta sent you. Tag me in your post when you get your merch, when you get your your vinyl or your gear. Tag me at Jamie Josta on, uh, on Instagram. And I don't even know what it is on Twitter anymore because I got hacked. I think it's Sim Swap or Sidge or something. It's, it's some wild. What? Yeah, it's it's whack. They won't. Elon won't let me change it back to my name. Somebody picked up my name, so now they got the, my name on the profile. It's whack. So that I blocked sucks. them. Yeah, it's 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 whack. Uh, anyways, check out indiemerchstore.com promo code Josta10 martyrstore.net to contribute to the new Keith Buckley album from his new bands. New band, Many Eyes, featuring Nick and Charlie. You know him from uh, Josta, Kingdom of Sorrow, D. Snyder Band. I'm executive producing the album, and you can contribute right now and get your name immortalized in the vinyl and the CD and the cassette. Not the cassette, sorry. We don't, we don't put the names. It's, it's too tiny. You can't read it anyways. It's, a, it's not enough space on the uh, inner jacket. It's like just a little. Exactly. Slow, you know? No, exactly. Now, of course, now since I said that, somebody's going to be like, that's the only format i wanted my name and so i'm not supporting it all right um patreon.com slash josta gas you'll see all the shows over there shows like is is in, is no fucking regrets gonna come back like, how I don't, do we get him back? i don't know I, I don't think it is uh we we'll see he got he got too he got too stoked on uh on wakeboarding and fucking raging and doing live streams his live stream is incredible i saw the one that he did with uh with dino and they they covered destroy everything shout out to yeah, dino yeah. and uh and um 
Milo, Milo, Dino and Milo, they were rocking. It was awesome. Um, what about, uh, I got a shout out. What was the other one that was, what was the kid who fought CM Punk? Oh, Mickey. Yeah, it was, when's his show? Uh, I believe that's right before the Josta show on Tuesdays. Um, let me check that schedule. But uh, yeah, they do a weekly show as well. It's called Slick right and on. Thick. You'll see it all over at gasdigital.com, patreon.com slash Josta for a bunch of extra bonus content too. And we're going to be watching the upcoming movie or actually the old movie, Double Team. I'm sorry. Yeah, just you got to watch that tonight, huh? Are you going to watch it tomorrow? Uh, yeah, we'll see when I got time to do it. Probably in the morning. Well, good luck. You're going to need <laughs> it. Double team with JCVD. You'll see it. You'll see it over there if you want to sit in on it. The link will be posted over at patreon.com slash Jossa. All right, everybody. Drink your coffee. Do your push up. Listen to Death Metal. We'll be back with KK Downing from Judas Priest. Bye-bye. Produced by Brian McKay. Executive producers Jake Olszewski, Ben Lee, AJ Lewis, Garrett Keeping, Dan Smith. Nick Torito, JJ Hernandez, Joe Bartovic, Jason Jarvis, Chris Larice, Alex Smolin, Todd McKee, John Blewett, Richard Miller, Kyle Marg, Nate Leffingwell, Morgan Costner, Mark Tag, Zapagor Waikato, Niall Scollard, Kathy D'Ambrosio, Justin Steven, Jack Flanders, the Pit Commander, Andy Wilson, Jeffrey Kuhn, Kimo Humalamaki, Jonathan Metis, Brandon Cooper, Matthew Jankowskis, Jamie Kutcher, Ryan Undercoffler, Matt West, Ryan Maurice, Chad Green, Dallas Hendricks, Jacob Arensberg, Kenneth Moore, Kona Butterflies, Stephen Helm, Richard McIntosh, Jeff Stevenson, Ryan Williams, Larry Tooley, Dallas Bolin, Ryan St. Nathan Rex Madrid, Cameron Hendricks, Scandalous Official, Joe Monson, Let's Talk Resident Evil, Andrew Chase, Guy on the Couch, Chris Winchester, Antonio Reyes, Joe Otson, Dustin Stone, Lee Walker, Ryan Levson, John Hankis, Robert Bushaw, Troy Seal, Mark Horror Armenta, Jay Liberston, Nick Fowler, Mike Horgan, Emma Horgan, Arna Rock, Patrick King, Oscar Brummett, Stacy Steinecke, Fernando Somoza, Patrick O'Brien, Dominique Zimmer, Ryan Sanders, Lara Snyder, Daniel Burt, Milwaukee Metal Sausage, Adam Boss.